Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April, and I realized recently that we haven't done a proper study in a while, and um, really the reason that I was supposed to be doing these um, videos is for them to be Bible studies, and so um, I decided let's do one on Romans because that is one of my favorite books, and um, it's mostly because when I when I started at Friends University um, doing my bachelor's in religion and philosophy, Romans was one of the first book, um, classes that I took at Friends. And that book of Romans just kind of came alive to me um, during that semester. Um, it was just, just, I just was so enthralled with that class. Um, and I'll tell you one of my favorite um, scriptures from that book, but that's not part of the Romans Road. So let's do the Romans Road. And um, what is the Romans Road? Well, it, it's basically an evangelical tool that people use for to lead someone to salvation. So you can take those scriptures um, in Romans and just kind of go down the line through those scriptures and that can lead someone to salvation. So, um, but I was also looking up why Romans is so unique. And um, so I, I, I looked up some stuff here. Um, it has theological depth. It, so it's considered one of the most theologically profound books in the Bible, in the New Testament specifically. It addresses fundamental concepts um, of Christian theology, such as salvation, faith, grace, righteousness, and the role of the law in a comprehensive and systematic way. Um, it was, of course, written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament, we all know. Um, he's one of the most influential figures of the New Testament and in early Christianity. Um, his letters make up a significant portion of the New Testament, you know, etc. Um, so it has a comp or gives a comprehensive explanation of the gospel. So Romans provides a detailed and coherent uh, explanation of the gospel. It outlines humanity's need for salvation. Um, the nature of sin, the re redemptive work of Christ, and the role of faith in receiving salvation. So it makes it a key resource for teaching and understanding the core message of Christianity, which is the free gift of salvation. Um, so it does have some, it does address the Jewish Gentile relations because that's what was going on at the time. Um, it deals extensively with the relationship between the Jews and the Gentile believers. So Paul addresses questions about the role of the Jewish law and the inclusion of Gentiles in God's plan of salvation. And I've talked about that other times. This was a significant theological issue in the early Christian community. So the role of faith and grace uh, Romans emphasizes those concepts as central to Christian salvation. It teaches that salvation is not earned through human efforts or works, but it's a gift from God received by faith. So, and then there's the doctrine of justification, justification by faith alone, which is central to the Protestant Reformation. So that um, justification by faith alone is, is it's definitely, it's, something that came in when Protestantism came in, when you know Martin Luther um, you know, started the whole Protestant, Protestant uh, movement there. So um, most of the um, New Testament that Paul wrote are letters. They're just really letters. They're called epistles letters to these different communities. So this was Paul writing a letter to the Romans. And what I was reading is he hadn't actually been to Rome yet. Um, he was going to Rome, but he wrote this letter to the Romans. So he's writing like Corinthians is a letter to um, Corinth. 
to the Corinthians and Corinth, you know, etc. So, um, and theologians believe that Paul was in prison when he wrote this particular um, epistle <clears throat> and some other ones too, but I'm just focusing today on Romans. So, um, the exact circumstances of his imprisonment are not mentioned in the book itself, but it is widely believed that he wrote Romans while he was in Corinth during his third missionary journey um, or during his subsequent visit to Jerusalem. So there's some of the maps in the Bible will have um, the missionary journeys you know, that Paul took and stuff. Um, and so this is his third one, but sometimes you can see the first one, the second one, etc., in some of the maps. Um, Paul mentions his desire to visit Rome in Romans 1, 10 through 15. Okay, I switched everything around here. I was just not real comfortable with the where, where everything was situated here. So, okay, what was I saying? Um, so Paul mentions his desire to visit Rome in Romans 1, 10 through 15, and he sends greetings to several individuals in Rome, suggesting that um, he had connections with some of the Christian community there. Um, and Romans 16, 22 contains a reference to a scribe, named, a scribe named Tertius, who wrote down the letter as Paul dictated it. This was a common practice in the ancient world, especially for someone like Paul who may have had limited access to writing materials while in prison. Throughout his missionary journeys, Paul faced imprisonment and multiple occasion, on multiple occasions for his preaching of the gospel. His imprisonment in Rome is documented, documented in the book of Acts where he spent two years under house arrest, Acts 28.30, it is during this time, or possibly during a previous imprisonment, that he is traditionally believed to have written the Book of Romans. So there's controversy here. Um, so some think that he was in Corinth um, when he wrote this and hadn't been to Rome yet. And then some think that he, you know, this was a previous imprisonment, but either way he was imprisoned when he wrote this so you know i mean it, it's just mind-blowing to me how a man in prison can write such amazing pieces of <laughs> well you know such a beautiful cr christian writing i mean how is this possible so you know in our in our natural carnal minds we think you know, being imprisoned would be horrible. It'd be like the worst thing ever. But when God tells us in his word that he will work everything together for good. So not only that, I think this even goes further than that because he, he works everything to good. So he's going to take this imprisonment or whatever it is that you go through and you could be, you know, Paul was physically imprisoned, but there are people that are imprisoned in their heart, there are people that are imprisoned in their soul, in their emotions, um, you know, uh, for whatever reason. So um, God can take those things and still make something beautiful out of it. So, I mean, I would argue that Paul well, maybe would not have written these letters had he not been imprisoned because sometimes God has to get us to a place where we can hear him where we can take enough time to listen and be able to do that thing that we are supposed to do right so so here we see that him being imprisoned was not such a horrible thing because what came out of it is something that has impacted generations and generations of Christianity from the early Christians on until now and there are some of the most beautiful writings of the Bible. So how can this happen in prison? Well, through God. I mean, God can do anything. One of my favorite sayings is, God starts at impossible. And I truly believe that because, uh, you know, if you've, if you've understood that God is sovereign and he is, you know, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent,
present, then you would understand how powerful he is. And um, you would understand how, how that is a recipe for someone that can do the impossible. There's just no way that he can't. So, um, so let's dive into the Romans road. So we're not going to go through, you know, all of Romans, but, but the Romans road is where we're going to go. So, uh, let's see a couple more interesting facts about Romans. So it's the longest of all the Pauline epistles. Um, it consists of 16 chapters. It's known for its theological depth and complexity. It covers a wide range of topics related to Christian theology and practice. So, you know, if you were to go in depth, if you were to do a, what do they call that? Um, there's a word for it where you go word for word and you, <laughs> it's very tedious and um, you study that way. I have done that with my mentor several times and, and like if you take one of the Psalms and you go word for word and you go look back at the Greek and you go find all these things and all this understanding, then you go in depth into the scripture and, and you could study for hours. I mean, and that's what I love about the Bible. That's what I love about studying theology is that there's so much to learn. And the more you learn, the more you know that there is to learn. There's more to learn. So, um, so the Romans Road outlines some of the core principles of the gospel. It provides a structured and systematic presentation of these principles. Um, so that makes it popular for evangelism, evangelism and teaching. Um, so in here he expresses, Paul expresses his intention to visit Rome and Rome's one, Romans 1. Um, and he was also martyred in Rome. So Paul was martyred. So Paul was an apostle and a lot of the apostles were martyred and I would love to read, there's there's a, a sheet of paper that shows how all of the martyr, the apostles were martyred. Um, and it's kind of gruesome, but it's just like, wow, you know, it, it's a very powerful thing. And I actually have a set of um, books about the martyrs. I mean, they there's some just powerful, powerful things to study in there. Um, on that topic. So I pulled out, um, this was my grandmother's um, date annotated Bible. Um, the other day I did a video on how many Bibles do we have in our house? How many Bibles do I have? And um, I think we came up with 61 Bibles, which is kind of crazy. But I went ahead and pulled this one out because um, my dad loved the Dake Bible and the, the Bible that Edgar gave me from Costa Rica is the Dake Bible that my dad had. That's why it's so heavy because it's annotated and it has a bunch of notes in it from Dake himself. And so um, he had given one to my grandma. So this was hers and uh, I love this. Um, so, um, I was reading about Dake's testimony and how he had um, prayed and prayed for God's um, direction for his life and you know he wanted something very specific from God and so what God gave him if you read Dake's um, testimony is that one morning he felt um, he, he felt like it was like he, he it was like a dove kind of descending type thing it's this whole thing and and god gave him the ability to um pull up any scripture that at any given time that he needed to so that was the gift that he had so he used that gift to make the dake bible so when he would think of a scripture god would give him another scripture that would go along with that, that correlates. So his thing is that um, you don't interpret the Bible or you don't interpret 
the scripture just kind of by itself. It's got to have another scripture to back it up, one or two more scriptures to back it up. And I love that because someone can just take one line out of the Bible, one line out of a verse and, you know, go gangbusters with it and just like use it for all kinds of stuff. And we're going to save that for another scripture or another video because there's a lot that can be said about that. But when I was reading, looking up here in the date, um, so chapter one of Romans, before the chapter starts, it says, um, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And I thought, I love that. I love that, um, that phrase, separated unto the gospel of God. So see, you could do a study on just that. What does that mean? So when I looked at Dake's notes on separated, it comes from the Greek aphorizo, which is set apart. Um, and the translation is separate. So then he gives all these other scriptures on how, you know, you can be separate. Da, da, da. And then it says divide and sever. So, I mean, we could look up some of these scriptures like Acts 13.2. I'm going to pull that in my little amplified here. I found out when we went through all these Bibles that I had two of these. <laughs> so, I thought it was okay to take this one. And then I had two of a couple other things, two or three of some other Bibles. Okay, Acts 2. Where am I going here? No, Acts 13, 2. Okay. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Separate, separate now for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So when, when the scripture talks about separating unto him, or like this says, separating unto the gospel, so he, it's like his life was set apart for that specific thing. Paul's life was set apart specifically to do this, to to write the epistles, to, to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things that are now in, you know, our scriptures. It's just amazing. So I loved that. That's before it even starts. But anyway, so another, um, so I also have my little slimline um, New American Standard Bible. So I've got three different, well, I guess you could, the, the Dake is not really a translation. It's just notes, his notes. So what translation is this? Anyway, um, I think it is uh, King James. It's the New King James. Nope, it's the King James. Okay, well, anyway, I want to get a dake that is, um, that is a different translation. So I'll have to look for that. Always looking for new Bibles, right? Like 61 Bibles isn't enough. <laughs> so, okay. So the theological influence of the book of Romans so some of the key concepts we talked about in the very beginning, justification by faith, the role of the law, so um, the sovereignty of God, all of that is explored in this book. So the role of the law, that's another video that I would like to make because there is this huge distinction between um, the Mosaic law, the law that God gave Moses back in the Old Testament, you know, on Mount Sinai, um, versus justification by faith, um, you know, versus this free gift of salvation. So, so there, everything changed in the New Testament, right? Things are not the same. So in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't come yet. So yeah, so you needed all of these different ways of doing things. But now in the New Testament, 
it is so different. So people that are living now and trying to do the Mosaic laws or trying to do uh, Christianity through a law, uh, you know, laws, it becomes works. And so we are not saved by works, right? We are saved by grace. So, so you have to be really careful with, with, um, people that are, I mean, there's different terms you could put to it, you know, uh, pharisaical or, um, legalistic. So there's this legalism in the church. And so that, that can be a whole nother video, but that's why you can't dump all of Christians into the same lump, right? Just like you can't do that with any other, you know, um, groups in society. You know, some people say, well, lawyers are all this way. Um, Christians are all hypocrites. You know, um, so-and-so, this group, they're all this way. You can't lump everyone in because there's always good people in, in all of those different segments of society, right? You can't say all or none. Those are not they're typically not legit because if you search for a good one, you're going to find one, you know, not all doctors, you know, are the best, but if you search for a good one, you're going to find one. So if you search for a good Christian, you're going to find a good Christian. So just because a Christian one day said this or that or whatever, or did something wrong, then you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and act like, well, they're all that way. It just doesn't make sense, right? It's not logical. So you can't do that with Christianity. Um, so the Christianity that I teach is one where um, you're, you're not bound in legalism. You're not bound in um, um, pharisaical works. Because someone that is bound in those, they, they really are, it's like they're bound up in chains. And so whatever they teach and whatever, whatever they try to preach is going to have that same kind of effect on people. And you don't want that. So what Jesus came to do is free us, right? He, he fulfilled the law. So yeah, it's, it's still there, but it's, it's fulfilled. So we're not bound to it. We're not in the Old Testament. I don't know if this is making sense, but I, I do want to do a video on, on on legalism because it's a huge thing. I had someone really close to me who was very legalistic and you just can't hardly deal with it. So there is a segment of Christians out there that are are very free because they spiritually, they believe that Jesus um, gave us this free gift and we are only going to heaven through faith, right? Faith in, in Christ and salvation and, and what he did for us. And so there's nothing we can do to earn it. So the works that we do, they're not works that we are bound to because we are trying to um, gain uh, God's acceptance. There are works that we do out of the love that we already have for him. So there's a huge difference there. There's a huge difference. One Christian is very much bound up and, and they would be like the Pharisees in the Bible where you can't do something on the Sabbath. Like actually telling Jesus, you can't do this on the Sabbath or that on the Sabbath. That's what I mean by bound by the law. Jesus was not bound by the law. He was free. You know, he's, he's still bound by um, any spiritual laws. He's still bound by the attributes of God. That part's not going to change. So we really need people to be speaking and teaching and preaching about this a lot more. Because it's just, it's very lacking. And so a lot of people don't know the distinction there. Um... Let's see. So Romans is written to a diverse audience. 
um, because the Roman church was composed of Jewish and Gentile believers. We talked about the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, the Gentiles are grafted into the same vine. So, but throughout the letter, Paul addresses issues that are related to the diverse congregation, including the role of the law, circumcision, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ, I'm just reading off some stuff that I kind of looked up here. Um, so it has, so this book has not only um, deep theological concepts, but it also has practical instructions for Christian living. That's why it's such a really cool book because it kind of has both. So Paul addresses issues like humility, love for one another, submission to authorities, responsibilities of believers. Um, he describes the church as a body with many members, each with different gifts and functions. Um, so that's in Romans 12, where he talks about uni unity and diversity. Um, he quotes from the Old Testament. He draws from the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures to support his theological arguments, emphasizing the continuity between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in Christ. So then there's a doxology in Romans 16, um, 25 through 27. So a doxology is kind of um, a song or a prayer praising God. Um, so this one praises God for his wisdom and the revelation of the mystery of salvation. So they're calling it a mystery. So it kind of is a mystery because it's a free gift and, and no one in the world um, the world as we know it gives anything away for free, right? It's just not a concept that we can really fathom because there's nothing free, right? There's nothing free in this world. And so I think people don't understand that. Um, so it's had this great impact on church history, okay? Romans has. So let's go to the Romans Road. So we're going to start with, um, okay, we have a series of Bible verses here that outline the fundamental concept of Christian salvation. So we're going to go with, through Romans 3.23 first, and I, I do want to read it in the New American Standard, Romans 3.23, let's see here, 23. Okay, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So do we stop at 23? Yes. Okay, this verse establishes the universal problem of sin, emphasizing that every person has sinned and fallen short of the perfect standard of God. So if God is perfect, holy, pure, all those things, we established that before probably need to do more studies on that too but so sin is basically something that is um, where we fall short of the glory of God right so let me see if I can explain it a little bit better here if I look that up too so sin is a thought, word, or action that violates the moral and ethical standards set by God so God has these moral and ethical standards and sin basically violates that. So it's not like, um, it just, we, we need to understand this concept of sin. It just goes against God's attributes and who he is, right? So, um, let's see, it, it, sin introduces impurity and imperfection into the relationship between humanity and God. It disrupts the harmony that God originally intended. So he wants us to have this, you know, um, very clean and easy access to him, right? And I talked about this in a couple of my other teachings that um, you, you, the reason that purity and and righteous living is such a big thing with God is because he is pure and righteous. So in order for your communication with him to be unhindered, right, unhindered, then you need to, um, if you have sinned, you need to ask forgiveness for that sin because 
um, the sin is going to put a chasm between you and God. So now your communication isn't that great, right? Or we talked about having that line mucked up before and we need it, we need it open and pure. <clears throat> Same thing with anybody that you know in your life. You know, if if you have done some sort of transgression to your, um, let's say your spouse, your mate, then there's going to be a communication breakdown. The communication is not going to be very good until that is cleared up, and now you can have a um, open, you know, clear communication. I don't know how else to describe this right now. <clears throat> so, um, so sin leads to like a moral disorder if we're talking about it in the masses, in communities, um, in societies. It can manifest as actions that harm others. So what's 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 so interesting is that a lot of laws on earth line up with with spiritual laws because they're trying to create order in the world and that's what God wants. God's very orderly. He's he's you know he's all good. He's all about the purity. He's all about um, harmony. And so we have to have laws in the earth that force people to uh, um, you know stay that way. We can't have anarchy and chaos all all the time. So people are like, well. I, I shouldn't have to obey that law. Well, we all need we all need to have you know orderly conduct in the world and you know respect other people, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can't just all run around and have you know chaos. So it it's just that's that's kind of what sin produces. So sin is going to produce some sort of chaos, some kind of disharmony, disruption in your life which also separates you from God. So so whatever the consequences of that sin are um, is the disruption, right? It's 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 the thing that's not good. So so um, asking forgiveness for the sin, you know, is is what we need to do, but it's not just a forgiveness, it's a repentant heart. So I am very much an advocate of repentance. There are some teachers, preachers out there that are not even advocating for repentance. And that is not biblical because the Bible teaches repentance. Um, and so that's another video too. But <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's why this is starting out with sin. So it, it is telling us here, you know, right off the bat, I'm going to go back to, what is it, Romans? What's that first scripture up here? 323. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's saying that we are all, we're all going to do this. Then we go to Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. What the heck does that mean? It means that the more you play with sin, the more you, the, the road of sin leads to death, whether it be physical but he's mostly talking spiritual here. It's going to lead to spiritual death. If you continue on a path of sin, then that leads to, it, it, it's a separation from God. So you're gonna get more and more and more and more and more separated from him. And eventually it leads to spiritual death. I mean, I don't know how else you could say it right now, but um, so, so rectifying those things, and, and here's how you know, you're gonna know because you're gonna feel convicted over something. God's, the Holy Spirit will put that conviction on you. And so you'll know that something you've done is wrong. Something you've done has put you in a bad spot. Something you've done has separated you from him. He doesn't want you separated, but the, the thing is you have a choice, we all have a choice. So, so and it's not like, oh, um, you know, sometimes you think, well, this is trivial, and how can this be sin? But you have to know the attributes of God and who he is for some, and to know that you're going against that. If you don't know these basic things over here, then you may not realize that something you do is sin. Now, God understands that. He knows if you maybe you've sinned and you didn't know you sinned. Okay, he gets it, you know. So, 
But this is why studying and knowing God and knowing his attributes and knowing who he is and knowing his nature is key to this whole thing. So, um, so it's, it's a consequence that leads into death and separation from God. So then Romans 6, 23b, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is introducing the concept of God's gift of eternal life through faith. Let's see what it says in the New American Standard 623b. So it's telling you the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so it's like, you know, you don't have to go down that path. You can have eternal life with Christ. So it's like, it's not just telling you what can go wrong. It's giving you the solution right there in the same verse. How awesome is that? You know, it's like, um, you, you just have to have faith. Now, one of the things that I really want to study is faith because that, that is a, it's a fundamental part of, of Christianity, of, you know, uh, of, I don't want to say my religion, but just of being a Christ follower, you, the faith is key. So I really want to do a study on that because there are all these different views, doctrines, whatever of, of faith and what it does and, and how it affects our lives. So I, I just need to do that study for myself, but I'll probably post about it too, because it's going to be a really powerful um, eye-opening thing to study sometimes I pray for um, someone for healing and and I know that I don't have the faith for it I just know that I don't have the faith for it so so I have a lot of questions there myself about the faith thing um, I've had some other experiences too where I'm like I just I question this whole faith thing so, but I know that we have to have faith. I know that we have faith. Um, so we're going to have to just leave that there. Okay, so Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is highlighting God's love and redemptive work of Jesus Christ. So he knew that we were sinners. He died for us when we were still sinners. So we didn't get ourselves all um, cleaned up first before we come to God. He already redeemed us with all of those things that we have or that we, we were already, you know, we already were already tainted with. Um, you know, there's people that believe that people are basically good. Well, no, they're not because we're all born sinners. We're all born... Um, we're born innocent, but um, we have a tendency to sin. So we are not basically good. I think what people mean by that is that um, people want to be good. I think people have the desire to be good, but they don't always make the right choices. We have a tendency to sin, and that's because of our flesh, you know, and so... That's one of the big things about not um, basing your life or not um, um, basing decisions or whatever on feelings because I think a lot of times our feelings get us in trouble. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure you already know this. You, you can't base your life on feelings because feelings are very fickle. You have to base your decisions on something that is concrete and strong and true and like a you know, you know, um, something that has a foundation on it, a base. So, um, where was I going with that? I'm not really sure, but so, um, he died for us while we were still sinners, right? So then Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this emphasizes the importance of confessing Jesus um, and believing in his resurrection, resurrection for salvation. 
so this is one of the things that I I don't want to say it's a pet peeve but it's just one of those things where some people are like well how come Jesus is the way I think I even heard Oprah say that one time well why you know like how come Jesus is the way because he did the work he came down to the earth and he did all the work he did it for us intentionally this was not like oh you know second thought third thought or oh he dreamt it up one day on a whim the whole plan this is the whole plan and the reason that Jesus is the way is because he established the way it was his idea to establish the way he did the work he took he took um the pain he took everything on intentionally that's why he's the way i mean no one else did that that i know of no one else did that they didn't do the work so how can they be the way so so yes so god is the way right god is the way so people a lot of people say this to me i mean literally all the time um, and I don't really, you know, I'm not, a, as a chaplain, it's not my job to go correcting every little theological, you know, thing that someone has wrong. That's really not my job. So I have to bite my tongue a lot of times, but they'll say, um, you know, we're all worshiping the same God. We're all going to the same place. Blah, blah, blah. No, not really. I mean, technically, do you want to really get technical about it? No, we're not. And if we don't believe in what God did for us through Jesus Christ, then there's a problem. There's there's a problem there. Because Romans 10, 9 says right here, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So my answer to the question, why is Jesus the way? Is because he did the work. He did the work. So then we move on to Romans 10, 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. This verse assures that salvation is available to all who genuinely repent and call on Jesus as Lord. So God knows our hearts, so we can't, we can't fool God, right? <coughs> So you're not just going to say it because you're going to trick him into you, you know, that you believe that's not going to work. You know, God knows everything. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He knows everything. So that's why this says genuinely repent, because if you just say the words, it's not enough just to say the words. You need to believe in your heart. So that little Romans road right there, which is um, uh, chapter 3, verse 23, um, chapter 6, 23a, 23b, 6, 23b, Romans 5, 8, Romans 10, 9, and 10, 13, that can be considered the Romans road. I'm sure you can put other scriptures in there, but that, that basically leads you down the path of... Um, you know, salvation um, and faith in Christ. So it starts with the problem of sin and then it moves you through the salvation, the solution of salvation through faith in Christ. So starting with sin and why sin is bad and why we need to get rid of it and then moving through the solution, which leads, it's salvation is the solution, right? And then it ends with the assurance of salvation and those who believe so it it tells us our current state is not good and but it gives us a way to make it good you know which is awesome um, so I think it's a great tool I was also going to read uh, my uh, the verse that I really like I guess I'll throw that in there too See if I can find it. Okay. Um, so it's Romans 6 1. This was the verse when I was in, in front at Friends University that really, really struck me. Um, so when I studied theology there, 
um, right before I came, there was some famous theologian that was teaching there, and then he left right before I got there. I can't remember what his name is. The name John Stott comes to me, but I think he was the protege. So I think, I think my professor was John Stott. I can't remember, but it was this guy's protege. But this verse is so pivotal for me because it says, what shall we say then? So this, the title of this is believers are dead to sin, alive to God. So it says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? So, so there's this whole thought out there that because we have grace, we can continue to sin. Because God covers us with his grace. But this says, may it never be, exclamation point. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you know, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So, and that we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So the belief there is we die to sin that's what sanctification is so um you can watch my video on sanctification but so sanctification is getting um as close as you can to letting go of sin as much as you possibly can because we are supposed to die to sin so if we stay sinning knowing that we're sinning intentionally because God's grace is going to cover us. Technically, that's true, but we're not going to get very far in our spiritual walk. We're going to be stuck. Because if you do that, you're going to be stuck in a cycle. And it's a cycle of sin that you'll never get out of. Yes, God's grace is going to ultimately um, cover you the next time you ask for forgiveness, right? But you're not... You're not progressing. Um, so if you die to sin, that's when you progress spiritually. You know, you have to die to it. You die to sin. It's, you know, it's, it's the, it's what it's talking about, the circumcision of the heart. That's a whole nother video that I don't know. But <laughs> um, so it says, um, should we continue to sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we, he, we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? So when you get baptized, you li leave the sinful life. And when you come up out of the water, you're a new creation. So why would you go back to that old way? Why would you go back to that old way of living in the sin? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So, so there's this whole thing about grace. I'm trying to think, what were they talking about here, about grace? Let me see here. So they're talking about justification by faith. So, so we are saved by grace. So if you read Romans and you just read and you go through all the verses and you will just, it, it's, it's just so, uh, such a blessing. Um, you, you will see how this plays out, how um, the justification by faith comes into play and the salvation by grace so yes we are saved by grace but we are not sinning by grace that's not a teaching of the bible to sin by grace you just keep sinning because you have that grace available to you and then there's this whole concept of hyper grace that god has has um forgiven all our sins from here to the day we die uh, uh, so that's hyper grace. So we can just do whatever we want. That is not the message of the Bible. You don't do whatever you want. You leave sin behind. You, you, it, it's, you know, you intentionally crucify your flesh. You crucify all those things and you put them to death is what Romans is telling us. 
So anyway, I might do a second video on Romans because there's so much in there. But when I took that class, it was my love for theology just kind of just really blossomed in that class. And I think that was 1997 that I took that. But um, uh, what was I going to say? There was a whole thing I was going to say there. Oh, okay, so now I was gonna give my little update. So, <laughs> update on my life. Um, let's see, so with my health, I did I did go do the, um, the allergy testing and they, they basically make all these spots on your arm. It's like, it's like 20 on each arm and then they, they poke, they, they write what each one is that you could be allergic to, and they poke, poke you with each one of those and to see which one you're allergic to. So I was allergic to um, cedar pollen. I'm very allergic to cedar pollen. And I had told my doctor, I'm like, I swear, I always get, um, always get sick when it starts getting cold in the fall, like always. And so after he tested me, did the allergy testing, he's like, well, I can see why you're always getting sick in the fall. And like, you, you just didn't know if that was, you know, anyone's gonna listen to you about that or whatever, but it's because the cedar pollen in our state, that's when it starts, it starts in the fall. So that's when the cedar pollen gets, starts getting the worst. So I will always get um, really bad allergies and sick. I, I didn't know I guess I didn't realize it was completely allergies and I never knew when to take my allergy medicine and all that kind of stuff. But now I know that there is a cycle for cedar pollen. So it's like the fall through the spring, I have to be on my allergy meds um, because I am very allergic to the cedar pollen. There's a couple other things I was just a little bit allergic to, but that was the main one. So I found that out. Um, and then with my classes, um, I got good grades in both my classes. I was real happy with that. Um, that just confirms to me that I'm doing the right thing. And I had told myself that I, if I did this, that I was going to do it the right way. I was going to do it right. And so I, I did dedicate myself and, um, and in the classes and so it paid off so I got my grades and doing well there um, but that also just confirms to me that I'm in the right I'm in the right um, field you know it's like I just I just get it I just grasp it I just get theology I grasp it I understand it and maybe that's just something that God gave me you know it's a wisdom it's an understanding that God gave me for for theology and so that that confirms it to me you know being able to take the classes and get good grades it's like I just grasp the concepts and I believe that is a gift from the Holy Spirit I believe that is something that he gifted me and that I don't want to use it for good you know I want to use it for the right thing I want to do these videos and etc um, so I'm really happy to report that I'm ready for the next class, but it doesn't start for another few months. So in the meantime, I'm writing another devotion that will hopefully be on you version. Um, this one is, is a real special one and I really think it's gonna be really good. I'm going to hire someone to do the graphic for it. So it's not just like a photo that we get from somewhere. I'm gonna hire someone to really do the artwork for it or at least for the main part of it um because i want it to be impactful as 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 much as it can be um so let's see what other what other update can i give i think that's pretty much it for now so um i'm going to try to cut this video down a little bit and um we will We'll see you in the next video.